Greeting. Greetings. Thank you uh, so much for having me with you in your places. And uh, as we continue today uh, to look at the Word of God and the message God has for us today, I pray that you will be blessed and that you will be encouraged. And um, just as a reminder, uh, we are now coming to the end of our summer series. This is the, the last message in that summer series, and I hope you've had a chance to look at it and, and uh, follow along. And if you haven't, you can find all, our, all these um, messages online, whether it's on Facebook, on our Facebook page, Redwater Alliance Facebook page, or Redwater Alliance YouTube, um, YouTube um, on the YouTube, pardon me, lots of words there for a second. And so please uh, help yourself to that and pass it on to others. I, I pray that you'll be blessed and edified through it. The year was 1965, and the Rolling Stones released their hit, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And the first stanza goes something like this. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. And I try, and I try, and I try, and I try. The preacher, after looking back over all of his life, all of his accomplishments, all that he had possessed and experienced, concluded at the end of the day, at the end of all that, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. There's a fellow by the name of Stephen Graves, and in his article, The Five Big Questions of Life, provides us with his list of the five big questions of life. One, where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? How should I live? And where am I going? You know, if you were to type into your internet browser the phrase, the meaning of life, you would find page after page and page, page of comments and quotes and replies and discussions. Just to give you a couple, a uh, few, for example, here was one quote I found, quote, you were born to achieve to release your inner power, to fulfill your uniqueness. Here's another one, quote, all life is an experiment. The more experiments you make, the better. And one last one to give you a sample, quote, this life is worth living, we can say, since it is, it is what we make of it. So what is it? What is the meaning of life? What is your life? Well, the preacher of Ecclesiastes asked that question of his life as he was coming to the end of his own and came up with the conclusion that it was meaningless. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards wrote a song about their experience in life. They couldn't get no satisfaction, and they tried and they tried and they tried. Let's consider the other side of the same coin. Not everyone comes to the same conclusion as the preacher of Ecclesiastes and the Rolling Stones. There are people who are truly happy in their lives. Even though life throws us many curveballs, they are truly happy. And more than enough of these happy individuals are truly happy without God. You see, Stephen Graves, who gave, who, gave, who gave us his five big questions of life, would argue that many of us, in a number of ways, already answer some of these big questions of life, whether we recognize it or not. Let me ask you, have you ever pondered why you are here, why you were born? I mean, really thought through it, or you just give it a passing glance, or do you give it no thought at all? You see, reason and logic would suggest to us that if we do the hard work of thinking through, with the hope of getting some objective understanding of why we were born, we might be able to answer some of these big questions of life. Well, before we move on, let's turn to Ecclesiastes Chapter 12, and let's read together from uh, chapter 12, verse 9 through 14 to the end of the book. Chapter 12, verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and to uprightly, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the, ma the, end of the matter all has been heard. 
Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. And uh, we will be challenged today, I'm sure, by your spirit. And I pray for those who are listening or watching and listening or however that's happening. Pray, God, that you would uh, bless them with a message from you today. And, Lord, that not only would we hear this and respond to it, but we would put it into action. And, Lord, thank you so much and pray that you be glorified through all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopefully, um, if you were... Uh, with the other message that came last week in Ecclesiastes, you had a chance to read through it. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to read it. Because last week we came to the conclusion that the book is a perplexing one, for sure. It can leave one disoriented. And that is the point, in many ways, for the writer had at least that point to make. You see, you can have it all, you can try it all, you can experience it all, and end up as the preacher who said when looking back over all his life and the world around him, here in chapter 12, verse 8, the preacher said, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. All is meaningless. Then we have now just read together verse 9 to 14 as the preacher's final comments. And one wonders if this is the same person that we just heard from in the the verse 8 of the same chapter. If life is meaningless, why should anyone bother to do as the preacher now commends to us? Here in verse 13, the preacher said, fear God and keep his commandments. What would be the point of doing that? If life is meaningless, and as the preacher concluded, death comes to all, as he teaches us in chapter 9, why bother? Why not just get the most out of life right now in the moment? Why not eat, drink, and be merry, and then we die? Is that not what many people end up doing? Eating and drinking and being merry? And maybe while doing all that, deep down inside is that nagging question which keeps rearing its annoying head, why am I here? The quintessential hedonist of the 20th century playboy Hugh Hefner answered why I am here when he once said, quote, the major civilizing force in the world is not religion, it is sex, end quote. And Mr. Hefner Hefner lived out his why I am here happily until his death. And what might seem as the, the other end of the spectrum here, but I would suggest, just as another example, uh, possibly the greatest Christian apologist of the 19th century, C.S. Lewis, who, after living a considerable amount of his life without God, answered, why am, why am I here, when he once said, quote, the question is not what we intended ourselves to be, but what he intended us to be when he made us. So let me ask you, why are you here? And are you happy with your life? And I find it interesting how some can be very happy and at the same time have no need of God. Truth be told, some might even say, like this fellow once said, I am happier than most Christians I know. I do not need Christ to be happy. You know, thinking back over my life without Christ, and there was a, almost 30 years of that before I became a follower of Christ. And I can say, honestly, that overall, Despite all that was going on in my life, I was a happy fellow in my own way. Greg Morris, in one of his articles, addresses what he calls the happy heathen. I would have called myself a happy heathen. Morris doesn't speculate or give his own thesis regarding the happy heathen. Morris points to the Bible, and rightly so. And there in the scripture, in the Bible, the word of God, we find the apostle Paul, in the book of Acts and Barnabas, entering Lystra. And upon entering Lystra, Paul healed a man who could not use his legs. He was crippled from birth. And of course, the crowds, it says in that text, in Acts chapter 14, were so amazed and so uh, totally stunned by it that they cried out that Paul and Barnabas must be gods. 
And we see in that particular story that the priest of Zeus in the local temple even came and brought animals to make sacrifice to these gods. And of course, suffice it to say that Paul and Barnabas would have nothing to do with this. They tore their robes and they said, said this, Paul said this, we are also men of like nature with you and we bring good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Then Paul went on to explain that the living God made heaven and earth. And even though people had walked in their own ways apart from God for many, 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 many centuries, God had left a witness of himself. And Paul said to the people in Lystra, For he, that is God, did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You'll find that in Acts chapter 14, verse 17. See, Morris then points out, as he puts it, quote, a God who makes his enemies smile. You see, folks, the happy heathen ignores God happily, rejects him, demeans his name, eats his food, swims in his waters, walks on his beaches, camps in his forests, canoes in his, on his rivers, laughs, dances, and sings on his lands and ignores God. And God does not kick him off his land. God does not take the food away from their mouths, nor the oxygen in their lungs. Apostle Paul also said in Acts that God gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And as I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about believers and how hard it is for the self-righteous Christian, the self-righteous Christian, except that we serve a God who makes his enemies smile. That we are actually surprised when God blesses our neighbors who has no time for God. And we forget what Jesus said. As followers of Christ, as followers of Jesus, as born again, spirit-filled people of God, he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he, that is God, makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So back to the, the big question. Why am I here? Indeed, Graves was right to suggest that some have already answered the questions. The question, why I'm here, not to mention the other big questions of life. Indeed, the answers to these big questions will in many ways dictate how you will live out your life, how you will see the world around you. Let me give you an example, the question of origins. Where did I come from? If I answer that I am a result of chance, that the story of my life began long ago, long ago, in some primordial soup, then my primary concern will be for my own good that there is only one thing to do, to eat and drink and be merry. For in the end, I will die and be no more. You see, folks, the question we are focusing on, why I'm here, is a question of purpose. So let's rephrase our question this way. What is my purpose? What is your purpose? Do you know your purpose? What is the purpose for your existence? Hugh Hefner would have said to have sex. Some might say to make lots of money, to become famous. Some might say to help others, you know, to go to those hard places, to help the starving, the sick. Some might say to be a father or mother. You might say, fill in the blank. The preacher throughout his very perplexing book gives us, the reader, a sneak preview of our purpose. If you were paying attention to last week's message, uh, Pastor Alistair Begg calls these pop-ups, where God sort of just pops up in this perplexing book called Ecclesiastes. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, the preacher said, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. From apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? And isn't that true? At least I, stay. I think so. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 10 to 13, the preacher said, I have seen the business that God has given to the children 
of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to, to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14, the preacher said, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. So here's the point. For the happy heathen, all that makes them happy is from God. Now, for the believer, all that makes them happy is from God. Now, is that our purpose? To enjoy the blessings of God? Answer, yes. Answer, no. See, the preacher had it all. He had the cake and he had the icing. He had two servings. But the preacher was also wise, the text tells us here. Our text that we read. Was careful to study the meaning of life. He did so with great care. Matter of fact, it tells us here we recorded the words of truth. Verse 10. At the end of all, he said, fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The Westminster, Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism asks the question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. There's, you see a twofold purpose, to glorify God and to enjoy him now and forever. Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church, and he says this to us today, so that so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. For he has given you it all. I added that. That's my own. Don't take that as scripture. The Apostle Paul also said this to the Roman church and to us today, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And the psalmist the wise psalmist reminds us of our purpose. And it's not to glorify the created things, but the creator who's the good giver of all things. We read this, we, re we hear this, the psalmist said this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. You see, folks, from the very beginning of creation, humanity was created to glorify God. We see this in Genesis chapter 1 where we hear these words. God created a man in his image, and God blessed them. And at the end of it all, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why were you born? To glorify God. And to enjoy him forever. Well, folks, now comes the hard question. Are you fulfilling your purpose? Are you fulfilling your purpose? Now, of course, I'm presuming something here. I don't like using the other word. I'm presuming that you are born again, Holy Spirit, follower of Jesus Christ. And you read your Bible. And you pray. And you work in the gifts that God has given you. I, I'm presuming a lot, maybe. And then I'm asking the question, are you fulfilling your purpose? You see, the meaning of life is all wrapped up in the, the glory of God. Isaiah the prophet put it this way. Everyone who is called by my name, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The all meaning of life is wrapped up in the glory of God. If you understand this truth, then the answer to the question of origin follows. Where did I come from? Well, Isaiah tells us, God created you for his glory. God formed you and made you for his glory. If you understand your purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then the question of identity, who, am, who I am, is answered. The Apostle Paul said, if anyone in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God. John in his first letter said this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. You are in Christ, and God calls you his son or daughter. And I'll just throw one more in for the road, a little, little one here. Paul encouraged the church in Philippi to stay the course. They were under stress and pressure from the culture around them. He said, stay the course, press on toward the goal of the upward call of God, he said, in Christ Jesus. He reminded them because of Christ, their citizenship was no longer on earth, but in heaven. For Paul said, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. If you are a born-again believer, spirit-filled, you are a new creation. God calls you his very own child, and your citizenship is in heaven. And this brings us to another question. If this is true, then how should we live? Friends, this is a question of morality and ethics. And I point you simply to the preacher's own words. Fear God and keep his commandments. You know, I mentioned last week, and I'll mention it again, it's possible to misunderstand what it means to fear God. And we can go sideways on this. It can really create a problem in our lives. One commentator put it this way concerning the fear of God. Quote, to live in the fear of God is to be truly human. In other words, someone once said, quote, we are mortal and weak, but he is almighty. This brings up another question. How do we do this fear of God? How do we do this fear of God well? Well, I can simply just give you one word. Obey. Obey what? God's commandments. We go back to the Old Testament, the time of Israel, when Moses gave Israel the Ten Commandments. And we look into that particular story. We find that in Exodus chapter 20. Pardon me. And, and God was there present. And the people heard the thunder and they saw the lightning, flashes of lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and Moses writes, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off, and so rightly they should, and so rightly should we, if we had been there. But then Moses said this to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. I think today, in our Christian culture and in the world today for sure, there is no fear of God, for sin abounds in the church and outside. Friends, this is how we live our lives, folks, that we should choose, that we would choose to obey God's word, that we live our lives as an example of the new creation we are in Christ. And last but not least, if we come to some terms with our purpose, then we have our answer to our destiny. Where we are going after we die, and our culture is running from this question. They don't believe they want to die. Well, it's not a matter of wanting to die. They just are going to die. We all are. Of all the big questions that we come to in this particular message, this is the one I would ask the happy heathen. This is the one that was asked of me. I would say, happy heathen, do you know where you're going when you die? Then I would point my friend, the happy heathen, to what Jesus said about himself. John records this in his gospel, and Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Then I would tell the happy heathen that Christ gives us purpose. And fulfilling Christ's purposes is the goal of our life. That Christ gives us peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Then I would tell my happy heathen friend that Christ gives us power. That when the person is born again, a new creation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in that person. 
That through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can give a life that glorifies God. A life that enjoys the presence of Christ every day and then forever. And finally, the most amazing and wondrous thing of all, I would tell my happy heathen friend, that God in his amazing mercy and grace freely pardons us through Christ. For Paul said the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That the blood of Christ paid for my sin and yours. And thanks be to God for the blood of Christ which paid for your sin and mine. For the preacher reminds us here in the very last verse, God will bring every deed into judgment with every, thing, every secret thing, whether good or evil. Friends, purpose, peace, power, and pardon, all from God can be yours. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful book, Ecclesiastes. Perplexing, disorienting, but so much truth about our lives and the purpose of our lives that we can find here. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, you would bless them, top of their heads, the bottoms of their feet, and everywhere in between. And God, for those who are listening to this by chance or by your very uh, will, uh, that are not followers of Christ, that are happy heathens, I pray, God, that they would hear that you have a purpose for them and that they are called to that purpose if they would surrender their lives to you. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great time, great day. Shalom.